So over the years, we have seen quite the dynamic shift in design concepts uh, that case manufacturers seem to emphasize, I guess. We've seen the smallifying and the bigifying and then the re-smallifying and then the middleifying and now back to smallifying once again. And I think the reason for that is as hardware has gotten stronger and more powerful and Moore's Law has started to taper off, what we've started to be able to do is to take the amount of technology and the speed and the power and just shrink it. And with that, we've been seeing quite the shrinkage, if you will, and cold weather of computer cases. We've done more small form factor builds, I think in the last year, year and a half on this channel than I've ever done or ever seen. So what we're looking at right here is actually a brand new chassis that is quite the departure from the typical form factor you would see from something like NZXT, where the H210 was the smallest that they kind of offered. And then they took it and just sort of, and of it, I guess, to where now we've got a 13.6 liter trash can, if you will. And the reason why I'm calling it trash can is because it seems like what used to be the case, the case back in the day was they would take a chassis and just, and make it small. But now they're realizing, you know what? Vertical height, just like downtown architecture, is like, hey, the footprint on the table does not mean we can't utilize vertical space. So you're seeing a lot more of these tower type builds. So the H1 definitely, um, subscribes to that design philosophy. So it's kind of interesting because it's completely toolless. And what I mean by that is you've got the glass panel in the front, you've got this panel in the back, and you can see that just pops off. So that's fully perforated airflow. There's no filter on there. Um, but we'll, talk, we'll, we'll talk more about this in a sec. We'll go ahead and pull the front panel off, which is tempered glass. And this probably easier to pull off from the bottom right here, as you can see. And I've got the peel plastic on there still, so we'll do, the, we'll do the peel together. A lot of people don't get the importance of the peel, but we do. That was a great sounding one, Big. So as you can see, we've got both side panels off. Now once you take the side panels off, you'll see there's these two holes right here. And I know it's a black case, it's difficult to see in there. Um, there's two holes right there that these little tabs on the side panels, both on the glass and the mesh panel, what or what lock the main part in. So now that you've got the two side panels off, you can lift this guy up. And when you do that, you then get access to all four sides of the chassis. Now you might notice, we just unboxed a case, but we've got an SFXL 650 watt power supply that's already pre-installed with the relocation bracket for the power connector relocated to the bottom of the case, as you can see right here. And we also have a 140 millimeter AIO in here, which is perfect because, oh, that's pretty clever. The, the actual box for the accessories is kind of shaped like a GPU and it's right in here where the GPU would go. So that's kind of neat. Anyway, uh, we'll talk about that in a sec. So it's got a pre-installed AIO because the reason for that is the tubing run in this is gonna be pretty bespoke. I'm using the word bespoke because Phil used it earlier and I'm like, oh yeah, that makes, that's, a, that's a fancy word for custom. So included with that AIO though, it's obviously going to um, work with your mini ITX motherboards. And the cool thing about that is you have mini ITX options now that exist for both Ryzen AMD based systems and Intel, which is kind of nice because we all know that Ryzen is definitely leading right now in terms of core performance or the number of cores in a mainstream CPU. And when you have a small form factor like this, any advantage that you can get to cooling is, uh, is obviously going to be important because even a 140 millimeter AIO like this is going to do a better job than any air cooler that you could possibly fit in this particular form factor. Now the graphics card is installed on the back side of the motherboard, which is the car compartment, compartment, compartment. The, the compartmentalization. Did I say that right? Compartmentalize. So the chamber design, <clears throat> So the chamber design like this is gonna do a good job at separating the heat that's gonna be generated by the GPU and the CPU. So as you can see, you have a riser card here though that's also um, for connecting your graphics card. So your graphics card mounts over here. It's got this really beefy, robust mounted down riser card. And then this is the one that folds over here and connects to your graphics card. And what I think is kind of funny is they actually have like this foam piece in here that sort of represents your um, motherboard and where that's gonna go. Now to access your motherboard, 
Um, you obviously have to get that AI AIO out of the way, so I'm using my iFixer! <laughs> so as you can see, the AIO is mounted with these four screws to this piece, but it even has a little label right here. Oh, jeez. They got like a strong man to put these screws in from the factory. <laughs> screws. And then this just folds out of the way. And these are not captive screws, so keep them. See, that just folds out of the way with a little door. A little foam piece for transit. Here is our AIO right here. It's got pre-applied thermal paste. Um, this is not the same exact setup though as if you were to buy this separately. Because like I said, as you can see, these are very specific runs for this particular chassis. If you look at the top of the radiator right here, it's actually quite different in the way this all mounts, the way the tubes come out. It's very specific to this setup. And then when you're ready to install your graphics card or your CPU and your motherboard, you move the foam out of the way, you mount it down to these four right here, and then your <clears throat> setup is pretty much ready to go. So what will happen is once you close this guy back down and you install the proper installation mounting hardware, which I'm going to just on a hunch assume is in this box. So you got your different mounting solutions here. So AMD and um, Intel is already pre-installed. Pre You've got your power cable. That's pretty much all that's in here. Oh, you also have what appears to be an audio splitter for a single 3.5 millimeter jack like you'd find on a headphone or a phone to a breakout cable right here. So you can install both your, your analog mic and headset or headphones that way. Once you close this and your motherboard is in there, then all of the connections are in the bottom. And what's nice about that, once this is closed, if we rotate this right here, you can see the power plug is relocated down to the bottom and all your input output is also right here for your graphics card as well as your uh, motherboard. So everything will be coming out the back at the bottom, not like having cables draped down and looking kind of ugly. So as you can see too, you have these Velcro straps that are tying down the power cables coming out of the SFXL power supply, but the 24 pin is already in the general place that it would need to be. Same thing with your CPU pins or your CPU uh, power headers right here. Um, for connectivity, we've also got the pretty standard usual suspects. You've got your HD audio, which I don't know who really uses these that much anymore, but there it is. You've got your USB or your front panel connector, which I'm so happy that they've pretty much standardized this now. So instead of trying to plug in all the individual plugs, which can be very annoying, they're pretty much all in the same layout. USB 3.0, and then we have our USB 3.0. Because this is a 650 watt SFX gold rated power supply, you would be able to run all the way up to a 2080 Ti off of this. And if we take a look at the power connectors here, we've got two eight pin PCIe power with two more off of pigtails. So if your card uses a triple slot cooler where it's got three of these plates, if you will, that's not gonna fit because this only has room for two. Now this is a 2.5, they call it, because it only uses about half the additional height above that bracket. But I'm really curious as to how big of a graphics card we can fit in here. We still have some available height right here. I can get, you know, I can get four fingers in there. <laughs> nice. Yeah, there's plenty of room there. There's a few millimeters of gap. So I'm fairly certain the fans will turn without obstruction. So as you can see, we did fit a strict style cooler in there, which is much bigger than any reference card. And then with the power plugs being right here, it still clears this PCB with plenty of room to plug them in. And as you can see, they do give you some slack here. So you do have room to be able to plug that in. They also give you a SATA cable right here. Because one other thing that we have not talked about yet is hard drive space on this. Now in terms of storage, you have room for two, two and a half inch drives right here. Now it says lift here to release. And then this guy just goes, doop, just like that. So it is toolless. It's not hot swappable. So that means you still have to run a SATA cable and you still have to run SATA power to this. You can see that you have two pigtail SATA powers right here. So you can plug your drives in using this. If you're not using all NVMe, the only thing I would be mindful of if you're doing that on this particular chassis is the one on the back is gonna be right up against the graphics card, pretty close. So heat saturation could be an issue there, something we'll have to test in the future. Um, NVMe can be particularly picky when it comes to temperatures for um, you know maximum performance. So I was putting this all back together right now to show you guys a fully built one. 
Um, I just found an easier way to actually get a bigger card like this in there. So if you take it and just sort of lay it flat like this, kind of line the card in like that at an angle, you can actually slide it back this way quite a bit to where now you can see I'm clearing that bracket for mounting it down. So then if I just take it at that point, get it lined up, then it's easy to just slide it over once you get the, the tabs and everything lined up. So I just wanted to point that out because I mentioned a second ago how, how am I gonna get this out? Or you know, once it's in there, how are you gonna get it out? But it's actually not that big of a deal. So even with a big card like a Strix. So as you can see, the, the main front and rear panel well, I guess these are side panels, as Phil like, pointed out to me. Um, it's a single piece like this, but it's also got magnetic filters in there, which make it very diff or easy to take it apart and clean. So there's no excuse for dusty computers with this guy. So this is the NZXT H1 Mini PC. It's actually a pre-built using that chassis um, with their BLD or their build service. So the specs on this particular guy is an Intel Core i9-9900K with the NVIDIA RTX 2070 Super Founders Edition. It's got an Asus ROG Strix Z390i, so that's a Wi-Fi model. It's got the Team Group T-Force Vulcan Z 16 gigabyte 3200 megahertz memory, uh, an Intel 660p one terabyte uh, NVMe SSD, 650 watt SFX L80 plus gold power supply, and then of course the same 140 millimeter AIO that we discussed that comes pre-installed in the case. So this is using the same power supply and the same cooler, but all the other parts obviously are already fully installed on this. Now we're gonna do a, an acoustic as well as a temperature test on this. But what I wanna kind of show right now is what it looks like in terms of all the components being in there, cable managed, and not just trying to use your imagination as I'm flopping the case all around the table. You guys can see actually how well thought out this is in terms of service. So you can see now in roughly 10 seconds or so, I've now fully accessed the inside of this chassis. And if I wanna take that a step farther, I'm gonna go ahead and unscrew the AIO and flip that down because I'm kind of curious as to with things sort of managed and such, how difficult this is to get in there and, and let's say swap out RAM or something like that. All right. so. You can see now I could access my RAM if I needed to. I got both tabs right here. I can pop the RAM out. I've got access to some RGB headers if I wanted to add more RGB. There's the graphics card. So you can see how much less space it's taking up being a Founders Edition card, being a standard size. So the Strix in comparison, as you saw, definitely fills this void. Um, but as you can see, a, a standard size graphics card is no problem whatsoever to fit in there. So this being an RTX 2070 uh, super card, Clearly the 650 watt SFX L power supply is more than enough power for this GPU. In fact, it's enough power for all the way up to a Titan if we wanted to run it. Um, maybe that's one thing we test in the future is we throw a Titan in here because I fixed one the wrong way that triggered a lot of you, but that's okay. It works regardless um, to see whether or not the thermals are able to handle this. So what's gonna be happening here? The air is actually being drawn in through the cooler. So this is gonna be creating a little bit of a positive pressure situation into the chassis. And right above that, we also have the power supply pulling air in. Now this is gonna be exhausting that air into the chassis as well. Now power supplies these days, unless you start running them at the ragged edge, do not really warm up, even in a gaming load. They don't tend to warm up due to the, gold, the, the 80 plus gold, the quality of the components, the better efficiency means better heat management as well when it comes to the power supply. So you've got air coming in through the cooler, you've got air coming in through the power supply. The graphics card, as you can see, is also pulling air in through this mesh panel. So you've got the air sort of coming like that. There's nothing actually assisting the exhaust of air in this system. So one of the things I'm gonna be checking right now while we fire this up and then run a little bit of thermal testing is how simply positive pressure on one end with the amount of heat that a graphics card, even a 2070 Super can introduce into this chassis, handles the, um, which I guess a little bit of convection and positive pressure is gonna allow the, uh, the heat to expel because as you can see, the top is a solid panel. So there are no perforations, there's no holes, there's no vents at the top, which is the way that heat's gonna naturally wanna go. So as I was saying earlier, when we did the case portion of this, you can see everything comes out the bottom of the chassis and then just goes right out the back. So I'm gonna be doing a little bit of a torture test here. Um, 
I'm gonna go, go ahead and tweak some settings here that I'm fairly certain this cooler and this chassis is gonna be able to handle. I just wanna sort of demonstrate that. So I'm gonna be enabling the remove all limits in the ASUS multi-core enhancement. That means give us more power limit, more turbo boost. We also enabled the XMP profile, which is gonna speed up the memory, which is gonna put a little more stress on the memory controller, all those things. Because AIOs, like I've already said before, are pretty much gonna be better than any air cooler that could possibly handle this. And because we have the fan blowing directly on the motherboard itself as well, even though it's gonna be pulling in some warm air from the AIO, warm airflow over something is better than no airflow and just complete heat stagnant, stagnated, stagnation. stagnation and absorption. The other thing I'm also gonna be doing is going into the power settings and setting it to high performance mode, which is going to probably lock our clock at five gigahertz. And there it goes right there. So we are gonna be using Cinebench R20 because we can set that to loop as a 10 minute test. 10 minutes is more than enough time to saturate a 140 millimeter AIO to reach its equilibrium and show us what our max temperatures are. And we are going to see now what the behavior is the second we start the test. 4.8, so that's normal because we do have the 200 megahertz AVX offset enabled. And you can see our temperature spiked to 77 and mid, well, the our entire range of the 70s in terms of temperature. So the question is, what's the temperature gonna be at the end of the 10 minute test with an ambient temperature of 68 degrees or 20 Celsius? I think it's gonna be good. I mean, the question is, we know it's pulling cold air into the radiator because it's getting air from outside. Can it expel it? That's, that's what's gonna determine how well this test goes. All right, so the test just ended. We actually didn't get the camera started while it was still running, but we were sitting in the mid 80s. Now, if we look at spikes, we got a max temperature of 90 C on the package. And it looks like our hottest core was 85, 81, 80, 85, 81, 85, 83, 82, 79. So what does that mean? By going in there and increasing the power limit, allowing it to sit at all core five gigahertz, which is, which is above its spec out of the box technically, and without touching the fan curve, that's important too. We left it on standard. We didn't go in and do turbo or max fan, fan speed or any of that, which means that we sat about 15 C underneath TJ Maxx on the package. 105 is where it would start to thermal throttle and pull down clock speed. And as much as 20 to 30 C Mm, about 25C, between 20 to 25C on core temperature before throttling. So what we did was we took this small chassis, this 13.6 liters with its single 140 millimeter AIO with a basic fan, even though it's a, it's, a, it's a good fan, it's not like a super high static pressure, $30 super expensive fan, was ha had no problem dealing with the static pressure of having to push the air out sideways. Because remember, it makes a 90 degree turn. Um, it did it very quiet too. We rarely even heard the fan. And the cool thing about it is the hot air that's being exhausted, it's going out the back. It's pushing away from you. So we never felt it. And I put my hand back here while it was running and there was definitely radiating heat. There was like a bubble of heat right here, which means it was clearly working. So there's one other test we have to do and that is the truly hot component in a graphics or in a system and that's the graphics card because we didn't install the stupid msvcp 100.d. So for the GPU tests, the, the fan is connected to the motherboard, which is being controlled by CPU temperature. We know that CPU temperature does not, CPU does not go under a heavy load during games unless it's a very CPU intensive game designed to run off all that multi-threading. But GPUs, on the other hand, um, if you're not bottlenecking your CPU creating load, then the fan's not gonna ramp up. So I'm curious now what's gonna happen with our RTX 2070. And yes, I'm using Heaven, which is a DX11 title, not an RTX title because by going in there and making tessellation on maximum or extreme, and then putting 8X MSAA running at 4K, this is putting a lot of load on this particular graphics card. I promise you that. So I didn't put it in windowed mode because I'm dumb. We're currently sitting at 60C. So that means the stock fan curve and everything is going to be utilized here without us touching any of it. The idea is you got this system, it's a pre-built, you're not really a power user, you're not gonna go in there and start tweaking things, you just turn it on and you start playing your games. This is the behavior that you can expect. I am more than impressed with the cooling capabilities of this. It maxed out at 77C. That's where we've been sitting forever right now. That's not bad at all. At a 2070 RTX that's being pushed 
to run 4K right now, which some parts of this test, it drops all the way down to like 20 FPS. So it's still stressful. So there you have it. That's the NZXT H1 chassis review like we just looked at. And this is what it is in their BLD or their build pre-built H1 uh, mini PC. So you guys can find links to this down below. If you're looking at getting the chassis and building out your own system, or you just want to get a pre-built, I think the pricing on this is actually fairly um, competitive. So I'll put the link to where you guys can check it out down in the description below. I don't necessarily want to quote price because price does adjust and change. And so I don't want to date the video with an incorrect price. But if you guys want to learn more, click the links down below. I'm telling you, like I started off this video, small form factor is definitely making a comeback because the technology has gotten smaller in terms of CPU and GPU performance, or it's gotten smaller as a package the performance has continued to expand and grow. So now you can have small PCs like this that take up very little desk space. I mean, imagine this is your desk right here, right? You put that right next to your, your monitor. Look at that. Phil, as someone that you had a small desk at home and has a vertical tower, I would say that you agree with the fact that building your system upright like this is always a smart move if you have limited space. So there you go. Huge thank you to NZXT for sponsoring today's video and sending these products over for us to take a look at. Unfortunately, I've got to send this one back and I'm kind of sad because I'm super getting into small builds now. All right, guys, thanks for watching. And as always, sound off in the comments below what you guys think about this form factor. Do you like the vertical or do you like the more traditional rectangular design that's deeper? Anyway, thanks for watching, guys. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.